Um, and then which answer would you uh C. What? C for call. C. Oh, got it. Okay. Any other uh any other responses? Okay. No one else. Okay. So that's a great, it's a valiant effort. Neil, well, thank you very much for participating. The correct answer here was actually adenosine. It's adenosine because the rhythm here is basically a PSVT. And they've set this question up to throw you off by putting in that pneumonia. And, you know, you and I aren't usually, we're usually thinking that someone with PSVT is just going to be a healthy young person who came in with palpitations, but it's all throwing you off and they're, they want you to make the diagnosis from the ECG. It does look like a long QT because the T waves from any particular complex here are encroaching on the following QRS, but that's because the RT interval for, ba for a basic QRS complex is going to be set. And if you become tachycardic, the next QRS is going to start bumping up into that T wave. So um, it may look like a long QT, but it's actually this patient has PSVT. And so let me figure out how to get rid of this little uh, strip here. So look, if you're trying to make a diagnosis of a tachyarrhythmia, you want to know, is it narrow or wide? Is it regular or irregular, right? This, this, is, pretty, uh, this is pretty narrow, right? 300, 150, like 180. I just knew. Say what? Uh, so yeah. I'm muted, Dr. Centuria. Sorry, you can continue. Okay, that's all right. Um, but the uh, the heart rate here, you can see, you know, 300, 150, about 180, 180 to 200 beats per minute. It's regular, just scanning your eye across it. So it's narrow and regular. And then you want to know, is there, atri you know, is there evidence of atrial activity? If you look here carefully, there really isn't. There's an RS for the QRS complex and big T wave there. So there's no atrial activity. And this would be typical for PSVT or SVT. And then the question would be, well, what else is in the differential of a narrow complex, you know, regular tachy arrhythmia? And the classic list is basically sinus tach, atrial flutter, uh, PSVT, which we've got. And the atrial tach and junctional tach, they, they aren't going to be on uh, the exam. The typical QRS rate for sinus tach is going to be less than 150. So that's not this. And sinus has P waves. Atrial flutter is typically going to be about 150, and it would possibly be flutter, but they're not going to give you a flutter strip without obvious F waves. And then there's, whoops, then there's this PSVT, and this is typically at a rate of 170 to 220 beats per minute. You won't see P waves, or there may be retrograde P waves. And PSVT in 60% of cases is basically AVNRT. There's some other stuff, but the majority is this kind of thing. A re-entry loop, either within or including the AV node, typically goes about 170, 180 beats per minute, but it can be as slow as 150, as fast as 220. And here's a typical 12 lead ECG. You see it's narrow, it's regular, it's fast, it's 180 beats per minute. And actually, if you look carefully, you can see there's some little retrograde P waves here right after the QRS complex, these little bumps in here. But that doesn't matter whether you see that or not. Usually, most patients, you know, you're not really going to see any uh, atrial activity. What's the treatment of PSVT? The most common first treatment is some form of vagal maneuver. You know, in the old days, we just had them try to push the plunger out of a syringe, but there's also the modified Valsalva maneuver, where you basically have them push against the syringe for 15 seconds, and then you raise their legs up, you know, 45 degrees for uh, uh, 15 seconds. They're counting up to 15, and then they get this guy's legs up, you know, whatever, they're going to 90 degrees. But if you look, this modified Valsalva maneuver, this is gonna be successful. You'll see the rhythm terminate right there. Um, and so these are all considered bagel maneuvers. If that doesn't work, you can give adenosine, typically six milligrams for an initial dose and 12 if that's unsuccessful. That's the adenosine. And then they're gonna give it a flush. They're giving it 20 milliliters flush, but you could give it 10, you know, and you can raise their arm up. And then you'll see typically a few seconds later, typically less than 10 seconds later, you know, it, it'll convert. Uh, at least in this case, it does right there. And then you'll get, you know, there's some uh, sort of alternating uh, asystole with 
uh, uh, junctional or maybe ventricular or maybe sinus beats, but the sinus node is going to recover, and when it recovers, they're sort of like this, back in a normal sinus rhythm, 71 beats per minute. So basically, for treatment of uh, uh, PSVT, some sort of vagal maneuver, if that's not successful, adenosine, if that isn't successful, uh, they're probably not going to ask on the exam, but the next step would be calcium channel or beta blocker. And if at any point the patient became unstable, you just synchronize cardiovert them. Here's another patient, 27 year old man presents with palpitations that began while he was sitting at work. He denies any chest pain, shortness of breath or syncope. His ECG is here. Which of the following agents is most appropriate therapy? It's Neil here. Um, I'd say C. Procainamide. Procainamide. And why do you say procainamide? Oh, I um, can't hear you. you yeah, to... sorry. It's very fast and it's wide and it's irregular in places. So the only thing that goes that fast is uh, pre-excited AFib. Yeah. And Neil, you make some good points with wide complex tachycardia. I prefer procainamide for the junior Neils in the chat. I said, didn't I say C? Yeah, I was just emphasizing your point. No, thank you, Neil. Procainamide. There you go. And why not? Let me just ask, why not adenosine, diltizam, verapamil? Why not these other options? Well, I think that as Neil, Neil would say that all of these agents uh, block the AV node, which may just exacerbate the issue because you have an accessory circuit that can, as Neil would say, uh, conduct just as well without the AV node present. No, that's great. That's exactly the issue, right? If you look at this, this thing, the rate here is 234 beats per minute. It's wide complex and it's irregular. The rate is irregular and the QRS complexes are irregular. Some of them are narrower, some of them are wider, completely irregular and super fast. This isn't polymorphic VT. Polymorphic VT never has spicules like this, daggers like this. It's not that sharp. Um, so this is classic for AFib with a uh, you know, accessory pathway, AFib with WPW. So this is a wide complex, irregular rhythm. There aren't that many things out there. Any irregular SVT with a bundle branch block could give you an irregular wide complex rhythm. If you had AFib and a left bundle or right bundle, that would be an irregular wide complex rhythm. But um, you know that's not a ventricular type rhythm. Polymorphic VT torsades, that kind of group over there is the most common, really dangerous one. Um, and then AFib plus WPW, uh, not that common, but definitely you know dangerous. What happens if a patient with an accessory pathway develops atrial fibrillation? Well, now you've got this fibrillatory wave at 400, 500, 600 beats per minute, and it's got two possible paths down to the ventricle. It can go down the AV node or it can go down the accessory pathway. If it goes down the AV node, it's sort of slow through the AV node and then fast through the conduction tissue in the ventricle. If it goes down the accessory pathway, it's fast down the uh, accessory pathway and then slow through the you know, cell to cell transmission in the ventricle. So there's two competing pathways. The AV node will only conduct up to about 220 beats per minute, but the accessory pathway will conduct up to 600 times a minute. And what can happen then is you get some kind of combination of both of these creating the QRSs that you're seeing. Here's an example. This was a 59 year old woman with sudden palpitations and lightheadedness. This was her ECG. And again, this is a classic you know, AFib, WPW, ECG, very fast, 234 beats per minute, very irregular, irregular rate, irregular QRS complexes. If you look carefully at it, like at lead V1, you'll see these are sort of R prime complexes up here that look like this is identifying an accessory tract on the left side of the heart that's conducting towards the right. That's why it's upright in lead V1. Here you can see um, this part here at 300 beats per minute, this is probably the accessory pathway alone. And this area over here at about 150 beats per minute is probably a combination of the AV nodal conduction plus accessory pathway. And then over here where you get these narrow complexes, these are probably individual beats that went down the AV node and had no, had no uh, input from the accessory pathway. You can sort of see all three possibilities in this particular ECG. What's the treatment of AFib? 
with accessory pathway, WPW, what medications are you not going to give to patients with AFib and WPW, right? AV nodal blockers. And why is that? Because if you block the AV node, then you're going to shunt all 600 beats per minute of the atrial fibrillation down this accessory pathway, which can accommodate that. So adenosine, calcium, beta blockers, digox, and even amiodarone, considered contraindications. If they block the AV node, then you can shunt everything down the accessory pathway. And what could happen? What could happen is ventricular fibrillation. So over here, you see on this strip, this patient's an AFib with WPW on the left, where it's blue. And then over here, it basically overdrive paces the ventricle into ventricular fibrillation, polymorphic VT, VF. Here's another example. This patient, AFib with WPW over here on the left, and then they end up in polymorphic VT, VFib over here on the right. So all these agents really relatively contraindicated. Why not amiodarone? You know, what's the issue with amiodarone? Well, if you look inside the amiodarone, it's actually got beta blocker, calcium channel blocker properties in it, type 1 antiarrhythmics in the amio, in addition to the amio in the amio. You know, it's got everything. It's got a little bit of everything, which is one of the reasons why it's very helpful, but it's one of the reasons why it's contraindicated. What medications can you use to treat AFib with WPW? Well, that was a question that was asked in this, this particular question itself. It's procainamide. And why is that? Because procainamide doesn't block the AV node. It may actually slightly speed conduction through the AV node. That was a controversial claim, but it certainly doesn't block it. And it does block conduction down the accessory pathway. So in the patient, like this patient, if you see, no chest pain, shortness of breath, or syncope. In the relatively stable patient with uh, AFib and WPW, you could give procainamide. Now, I, I happen to have the ECGs from the same case that, um, that Rosh Review used. Um, and this is, the, uh, this is the ECG, and this is the ECG after cardioversion. And notice, after the patient was cardioverted, the patient has a delta wave with a short PR interval. You can see it here in the precordial leads. So this patient indeed underlying has, you know, a accessory pathway WPW. Okay, next question. 67 year old man with a history of coronary artery disease and congestive heart failure presents to the ED with three days of palpitations and fatigue. A rhythm strip is obtained and shown above. Which of the following is the most likely diagnosis? I'm going to redeem myself. Uh, I think this is a flutter. Okay. And why do you say that? Um, it is, uh, I mean, you can just rule stuff out. Um, junctional escape should be slow. Multifocal atrial tachycardia will be, uh, you'll see irregular P waves, which we don't have. It could be fib. It could be flutter. It looks regular to me, which is why I picked flutter. It's two to one conduction. So, Yes. This is atrial flutter. This kind of strip, I'm not sure why, you know, there was a low um, low correct response rate. And I'm not sure what the, uh, hang on a second here. I'm not sure, you know, what people were putting instead, but this is clearly, you know, it's regular, it's narrow, and it's got flutter waves in it. One of the key clues in here also, the congestive heart failure, you know, flutter is often secondary to structural heart disease, heart failure, COPD, obstructive sleep apnea. So this is an example of a tachyarrhythmia that's narrow and regular. And then you have to ask yourself, is there atrial activity? And the key here is where is the P wave? So if you look in here and you want to say, okay, here's the QRS, here's the T, that's a P wave. Now this is a lead two rhythm strip. That's a negative P wave. So you know automatically if this were really, if that's really a P wave, this is some junctional rhythm, uh, because it's a negative P wave there, it's either an ectopic atrial tachycardia or a junctional rhythm, um, but this would have to be at a rate of 150, almost exactly 150 beats per minute, right? There's no PR interval in here. This negative P wave 
goes right into the QRS. And if you had, you know, the rate of exactly 150 beats per minute should always make you suspicious of atrial flutter. And if you look and think, could that be flutter? You'd be asking yourself, can I march out a flutter wave, an atrial flutter wave at 300 beats per minute? And in fact, that's when you can recognize this as atrial flutter with two to one conduction. Every other QRS here is landing on a flutter wave. And then the next one is just without a QRS. I'm sorry, was there a question? No, okay. just uh, more, more noise, it's okay. Okay, um, so this is really, this is flutter with two to one conduction and can be difficult to diagnose. But if you remember, atrial flutter is just a re-entry rhythm going around at typically 300 times a minute in the atrium and then there's going to be some, you can see it right here, going around and around 300 times a minute. And then there's typically some element of block at the AV node, two to one, three to one, four to one, right? The flutter waves themselves are almost exactly 300. They may be anywhere from 240, 250 to 340 or 350, but you know, the atrium's going 300. If it's a tough one, it's going to be two to one conduction at, with a QRS complex about 150. You know, three to one, the QRS will be 100. Four to one, the QRS will be going at 75 beats per minute. Atrial flutter is often difficult to diagnose when the conduction ratio is two to one. If you look up here at the top, well, if it's four to one, you know, you're going to obviously see that sawtooth pattern, but they can throw you off when it's two to one. It's much more difficult. You know, the exam is typically going to have a two to one uh, flutter. <clears throat> if, but you should be suspicious. If you have a narrow complex tachycardia at a rate of almost exactly 150 beats per minute and you can't see an obvious P wave, be suspicious of atrial flutter with two to one block. Here's an example. Here's a 12 lead ECG, right? The machine's reading it as SVT, but notice 147 beats per minute. And if you look at lead two, where we're thinking about P waves, this is very suspicious looking for flutter. You have to think about it. It's about 150 beats per minute, but it's every other. You can imagine now, once you look at it with your flutter spectacles on, there's a QRS on every other hump over here, right? That, that's what's going on. This patient's in flutter with two to one. The same kind of thing we had just seen. The treatment of atrial flutter, if they're stable, you know, typically for the exam, if they're stable, you'll give them rate control with calcium or beta blocker. If they're unstable on the exam, you know, it's going to be synchronized cardioversion. Here's an example. Sam, 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 sorry. Yes. Question. Um, I've always wondered about the thrombotic risk with a flutter versus a fib. Do you, are you aware of any differences? Like to me, in theory, if there's a somewhat organized, you know, atrial activity in a flutter wave rather than just random fibrillation, in theory, there would be a slightly lower thrombotic risk. Do you have any idea about this? Because I've I haven't really been able to find much. As far as I know, the American Heart Association doesn't distinguish them. Okay. You know, if the patient comes in, you're going to calculate a Chad's two vas score the same way for the fibrillation and the flutter patient, um, and you they get treated the same. Now they're not the same. You'll find out if you try to control the rate of a patient with atrial flutter, it's much more difficult when you're giving calcium and beta blockers. And the problem is that you're if you're trying to if you're trying to get them from two to one to three to one, you have to overcome a certain amount of inertia before suddenly it ratchets down from 150 to 100. If you're going in these blocks, two to one is you know a QRS rate of 150, three to one is at 100. Whereas in atrial fibrillation, it's relatively seamless because the because the uh, atrial activity is just bombarding the AV node. Every time you give a beta or calcium channel blocker, you're going to see a small decrement in the patient's rate. Whereas yeah. with the flutter, you may give five, 10 milligrams of metoprolol, and then suddenly you see it drop from you know 150 to 100. But there isn't a nice, uh, there's not as much of a nice seamless transition. And people have sometimes been thrown off by that, but that won't be on the exam. But to answer your question, no, uh, as far as I know, American Heart Association you know, considers them indistinguishable. And I'm not aware of any particular studies that have elucidated that, although I thought about the same thing. You think flutter is more organized and you're gonna have less risk of uh, thrombosis 
in the left atrial appendage because the because there's a more organized flow of blood, you know, within the atria. Sam, I, I think the reason why is that flutter is kind of a, an unstable rhythm. People don't usually stay chronically in flutter. They'll usually degrade to fib. Right. And that's probably why they treat it like it's fib because, uh, you know, they may not be forming clots in flutter, but they may be bouncing back and forth. And in the cases when they're in the fibrillation, they, they may be forming clots. Right. Right. That's a great point. I completely agree. There are, there are some articles if you kind of look up like PubMed and there was one here from the NIH saying that the adjustment after stroke, like there's a, there's a, like there's a less higher hazard ratio that it's somewhere. I'm seeing a couple of different studies here, anywhere from like 0.5 a bit to like 0.7, you know, like, so it, it's, it's, it says that there's a less risk of less risk of embolization. Um, but to Oz's point, right, you can flip between the two of them. But for folks who stay in these, it seems like there's a little bit less, but not enough, I think, for American Heart, right? Like you're mentioning, Sam, to change their recommendations about anticoagulation. No, that's a really good point. I haven't, thank you very much. I've never, you know, I, I just haven't seen the seen the literature. I haven't seen uh, anything about it, but I guess it's out there. And it's certainly, you know, as, um, uh, as Neil said, it certainly uh, makes sense. Okay, let's go on. Uh, 85 year old woman presents with generalized weakness for five days. Her vital signs are unremarkable except for heart rate of 130 to 150. Her ECG is shown above. Which of the following represents the first line treatment for this patient? Now, I apologize, it's not the greatest quality ECG, but I wanted to be true to actually using the very same, you know, ECGs that they used on the uh, in Raj Review. So this is theirs. And uh... it's uh, Neil, Neil again. Um, it's, <laughs> I'm sorry. I think, uh... <laughs> sorry, you're on Neil's computer. <laughs> I, I think this is a, uh, uh, right? Like AFib with RVR. Um, and the vital signs are unremarkable. Right. So you know she's not crashing in front of you. And the only symptom that we know of is generalized weakness. So she's probably stable. So <clears throat> I'd probably do DILT first. Um, you know, because adenosine, if you were confused about what was going on, you could try that. But this is a pretty clear cut EKG, I think. And then AMEO is a little bit aggressive right now for just uncomplicated AFib. And then cardioversion is, you know, she's not unstable, so. Right, right. I think for the for the exam, they're not gonna get into using amio for rate control um, and adenosine again, right? Adenosine is clearly gonna, is gonna slow it down for 10 seconds, but then it's just gonna come right back. And you're not gonna give synchronized cardioversion uh, because the patient isn't unstable. And in fact, they've said, uh, if you were thinking, oh, well, I'm just going to electively cardiovert her, um, she's been in the AFib for, we, we, it's reasonable to assume she's been in it for five days based on her, based on her history. So it wouldn't be considered safe uh, unless you were already on anticoagulation to, uh, to cardiovert her. Now, AFib can be, the point I wanted to make about this, AFib can be tricky to recognize when the rate is very rapid. And I'm saying that because we know automatically based on the questions that we use here, that less than 90% of people, you know, answered this correctly uh, on the Raj review. So I'm guessing somehow they got confused by the fact, you know, the rate's 180, maybe people looked at it very quickly and didn't notice that it's irregular. But it, with AFib, whenever you're trying to figure out if it's regular or irregular, look at the TR interval. The, the RT interval here is gonna be set. This is typically set by the patient's rate. And if it's irregular, what you'll see is the distance between the T weight and the next QRS complex is going to vary. And it's really obvious here when you look at it. This is all bunched up. And then it's you know, longer here, uh, very long over here. So that's a, that's a good way, if it's very subtle, to actually see what's there. So this, again, this attack here admits narrow, it's irregular, and there's no certainly no P wave activity. Although you might, uh, you might say that uh, you, know, you see atrial activity, 
manifested as AFib. Don't forget, if the patient has fine AFib, you may not see any atrial activity. But if you see, you know, an irregularly irregular QRS with no evident atrial activity, that's AFib until proven otherwise. That's a, you know, general principle in electrocardiography. Treatment of AFib, this is the same thing as what we we're talking about with flutter. If you're giving rate control, calcium channel, beta blocker, and if the patient's unstable, then you uh, you, know, you may choose rhythm control. That's going to trump uh, any risk over uh, risk of embolization. Don't forget the risk of embolization with AFib, if you take all comers, is around 4 to 5% per year. It varies depending on what their CHADS2 VAS score is. But if the patient is unstable, you know, you're justified in doing what you have to do um, if that's what you need to to uh, to get their uh, you know to to uh, stabilize them again they're not I don't think they're going to give you that question on the uh, on the exam unless it's very carefully worded. This is uh, ECG from a 60 year old woman with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease presented to the ED with significant shortness of breath and increased sputum. Her vital signs at a heart rate of 150, blood pressure is 100 over 60, respiratory rate 40, pulse ox 88 percent on room air. She looks tired, pale and diaphoretic, and this is a rhythm strip, which of the following is the most appropriate treatment? Now, again, this is one of these questions where it's asking you to, to make a diagnosis based on the ECG, um, and then what would you actually do, you know, based, based on that diagnosis? Neil here. Uh, I think the answer is B. The answer is B as in boy? B as in boy. That's it. And the reasoning here, you know, again, this patient with COPD, what's the, uh, what's the rhythm? Uh, this is uh, multifocal atrial tachycardia. Yes. Multifocal. It's not a great example of it. Um, but this patient has COPD. That's supposed to be a giveaway you know, that this, this could be in the differential. She's short of breath, um, you know, heart rate 150, respiratory rate 40, pulse ox 88%. Uh, if you look at this sort of section right over here, right, you can see these P, there's a P wave. They look kind of different. This one, the second one, the third one, the typical diagnosis of multifocal atrial tachycardia is three or more P wave morphologies, you know, at a rate over 100 beats per minute. It's irregular. Um, it's going to typically be in a patient with uh, COPD. Um, here's a better example of MAT where you can see one, two, three, maybe even four, you know, different P wave morphologies. And basically what's going on is the atria is firing in multi, you know, multifocal places. And so the ultimate uh, P wave that you see on the 12 lead or the rhythm strip ECG is gonna look different because they're firing from different geographical areas of the atrium. Here's a great example from a 12 lead ECG. If you look at it, you can see, you know, again, um, one, two, three different, really obviously different, you know, P wave morphologies um, coming from down here on this strip. Here's another one. You have to be careful sometimes that you don't accidentally interpret this as atrial fibrillation. That you look carefully and you recognize that there are P waves there because MAT sometimes can, you know, if the P waves aren't that obvious and you look at it quickly, you're going to see, oh, it's irregularly irregular. It's AFib. And again, maybe, I don't know whether that's, you know, the mistake that people made uh, with that question. But here again, these are big juicy P waves that are, uh, you know, you can see at least three, three different P wave morphologies. Again, narrow, irregular. There is atrial activity in these patients with MAT, but it's just different P wave morphologies. So if, you, if, you, if you're dealing with narrow and irregular, the big one is going to be AFib. That's the most common narrow irregular arrhythmia. You could have atrial flutter with irregular conduction, three to one, two to one, three to one, four to one, you know, two to one, just alternating around. Um, and then MAT is not that common, but it's always, there's probably gonna be a question on every exam with it. Um, and of course, if you had a patient with sinus tack with multiple APCs, that would be, you know, narrow and irregular, but there's usually gonna be, you know, typically probably only two different P wave morphologies in that circumstance. But the typical patient with MAT is gonna be a COPD -er who's hypoxic, 
has pulmonary hypertension and is using a lot of albuterol. They're getting a lot of, you know, beta uh, effect, uh, which is jacking up their atria. Again, associated with COPD, hypoxia, pulmonary hypertension, and the treatment is just going to be oxygen, treat the underlying condition, the COPD. And if you needed rate control, you know, uh, some sources talk about using uh, um, uh, calcium channel blockers to try to reduce the ectopic atrial activity. But again, I don't think that will be on the exam. 65-year-old man's brought to the ED complaining of nausea for the last two hours. On arrival to ED, he has a cardiac rhythm seen above. His blood pressure is 110 over 70. He denies any headache, chest pain, or difficulty breathing. Which of the following is the most appropriate next step in management? Uh, Neil here. I think this is, um, so this is regular wide complex tachycardia. Um, <clears throat> so based on his age and the fact that he has nausea, I'd probably say this is VTAC. Um, just the fact that he has nausea does not make me think he's unstable enough because his blood pressure is okay. So I would probably try uh, procainamide first. Because this is, I think this is stable VTAC. That's a perfect explanation. And this is a classic question on the exam. They're going to set you up if it's if it's regular and wide and fast on the exam, it's almost always going to be VT. They're not going to try, you know, unless it's obvious, you see obvious P waves in front of the QRS. They're not going to try to give you some supraventricular tachycardia with a barent conduction. Um, and the issue for them is going to be if the patient is stable and they offer you, you know, procainamide or amiodarone, that's what they're hinting at. And the one, I was uh, 110 over 70. Let me see if I can, if I can see this here. Blood pressure 110 over 70. They're going to be thinking this patient is stable or he's not having ischemic chest pain or shortness of breath or lightheadedness. They're going to say, go ahead with chemical cardioversion, procainamide. So this is an example of wide complex regular tachycardia, which is almost always on the exam going to be VT. You could have a regular, you know, SVT with bundle branch block, at least in clinical practice. It's been confusing sometimes when a patient had, for example, an AVNRT, if they had PSVT and they had some kind of bundle branch block that made it look like, you know, a, a ventricular tachycardia. But as I said, they're not typically going to do that on the exam. Now for the exam, they're very specific. If on the exam they give you, you know, a VT patient and they're pulseless, the answer is defibrillation. If they're unstable, but they have a pulse, they're gonna want you to give synchronized cardioversion. And if they're stable, they're typically gonna be asking you to give chemical cardioversion. But in real practice, you may also decide that you're gonna give them a synchronized cardioversion. But these are very different. If it's pulseless, if they're defibrillated, even though it's a regular sort of VT. It's defibrillation. If they're unstable, but they have a pulse, it's synchronized cardioversion. Okay, 58 year old man is brought to the ED for chest pain that started 30 minutes prior to arrival while he was jogging in the park. Initially, his cardiac monitor showed sinus tachycardia, with a rate of 120 beats per minute. But while you're interviewing the patient in the resuscitation bay, he suddenly becomes pale, pulses, and the above rhythm is seen on the monitor. Which of the following is the definitive next step to manage this rhythm? B, defibrillation. Who, uh, let me put this back up so I can see. Who was It was that? Handsome Neil. Handsome Neil? That was, that was me, Dr. Centuria. Handsome Neil Babsler. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> you're all you're all killing me i don't know who's there look uh, i'm old i'm having trouble with names here okay um so that's mike right micah um so <laughs> um all right so the answer was defibrillation it's the next 
you know, definitive step. Again, this is not synchronized cardio version. This patient, you know, developed ventricular fibrillation. He's pulseless. Um, it's defibrillation. An unknown aged man who collapsed and is now pulseless brought to the ED by paramedics. Chest compressions are in progress. An intraosseous line is placed. His finger sticks 95. During a rhythm analysis, the patient remains pulseless. And you note the findings shown above. Which of the following is indicated at this time? B, magnesium. Okay. Any other? Uh, any? Um, also, Neil Boss are here. Uh, I would like to give some electricity. Different relationship. Uh, the, which which electricity? The kind for a pulseless patient, defib. Defib. Okay. The actually the answer is defibrillation, but I but I think the magnesium is the thing that's thrown people off in the past. And my question would be, why not the mag? Why would they say, oh, mag's not the best answer? He's pulseless. He's un dead. Unstable. Exactly. Dead. When they're pulseless, you know, on the exam, if the patient's pulseless, they're going to want you to defibrillate the patient. Um, and the, they're not going to want synchronized cardio. But what, like, what's the rhythm here? Torsades. Um, right. But I wonder, they, I'm guessing they'd be giving mag also. Like in a real world scenario, we would still give the mag. I would Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. They're asking you, like one of the other questions said, what's the definitive management? Um, they could try to find some wording here. But I guess at this point, they're not gonna they're not gonna give you any help, but they're saying indicated at this time. So at this very moment, while the patient is pulseless, the thing that you want to give is basically uh, you know defibrillation and not synchronized cardioversion in polymorphic VT. Um, <clears throat> the machine may have a difficult time trying to figure out. It's looking for a QRS and a T wave. It's looking to try to figure out where to shock the patient because it doesn't want to shock on the T wave and it does want to shock on the QRS and it'll be confused and it may it may either not fire at all or take five or six seconds delay firing a machine and for this they want the machine to go immediately so you just defibrillate the patient um, you know they're already in essentially a rhythm that's like ventricular fibrillation it can't get that much worse if uh, if uh, you've defibrillated the patient. Uh, so this uh, is an example, whoops, let me get this off. This is an example of wide complex irregular tachycardia. This is the least, you know, likely options among, uh, you know, uh, among the rhythms we've looked at. Um, and again, you could get it, you know, the most common source of a wide complex irregular rhythm is going to be AFib in a patient with a bundle branch block, but polymorphic VT and torsad are the, uh, uh, you know, the typical exam questions. Um, and again, we saw earlier AFib with WPW. I just wanted to briefly talk about this. Um, this is typically, polymorphic VT is typically seen in the setting when it's torsade of a prolonged QT. And, you know, if you ask, well, what's a long QT? You know, measuring the distance from the Q wave to the T wave. Typically on the ECG, you're looking to see, you know, where does the T wave fall with, within the RR interval? If the T wave ends before the halfway point between the RR interval, it's probably a normal QT. And if it's prolonged, the T wave is ending after that. Standard, you know, uh, 99th percentile for men and women are up here around 470, 480 milliseconds, but the key number is 500 milliseconds. If it's over 500 milliseconds, this is where, for the QTC, this is where the risk, you know, of torsade starts to uh, starts to come in. It's the greatest risk of arrhythmias. In my experience, you know, most patients that I've seen who actually had torsade, their QTC was up over 550, 600. Here's an example of a patient that you might see, where again, if you look, the halfway point, if you're just eyeballing the QT, you can see the T wave here ends way after the halfway point between the two RR intervals. It's way out here, which is really at, you know, 760 milliseconds. The actual QTC is about 731. It's close to the QT because the rate is close to 60 beats per minute. 
So if it's over 500, it's abnormal. You know, this patient is way out here at 731. This patient will be at a huge risk of developing uh, um, torsade. Um, acquired long QT syndrome is often seen in the, se in the setting of drugs that prolong the QT, especially in combination. There's a huge list of them. You can see them on a, there's a website called Credible Meds uh, where you can look them up. You have to be careful, you know, if you see a long QT sort of looking what the patient's on, but also hypokalemia, hypomagnesemia can do it. And just the key for the exam, if you've got a patient with torsade, if they're pulseless or unstable, you defibrillate them, you know, it's not synchronized. And then if they're stable, you can give them uh, mag sulfate. The mag sulfate, you give two to four grams, even if their mag level is normal. Pay no attention to mag levels. Uh, magnesium is very effective. Um, also correct any hypokalemia. Actually try to get their potassium up, you know, to slightly supernormal levels. That's a, that's sort of a, uh, um, a master's uh, uh, addition right there. Um, and you want to remove, remove the offending drugs, you know, the erythromycin, Haldol, uh, you know, metoclopramide, dancertron. There's a long list of agents that can do it. Let's take a pop quiz here just for SVTs. What, uh, what's on the top strip? What is that? Sinus tachycardia. No, I lied. SVT. Yes. And when you, exactly. That's, that's, and why do you say SVT? I don't see appreciable P waves, but the rate's fast enough that it makes me think SVT. Exactly. It's narrow. It's regular. The rate is um, 300. It's like 180. So it's typical. Um, and there's no evident P waves. How about number two? A flutter. A flutter. Great. Thank you so much. This is a typical example. It's a lead to rhythm strip. Where's the P wave? Well, this would have to be the P wave. But this P wave is giant compared to the QRS and it's negative. So that it can't be sinus tach. It would have to be some ectopic atrial, you know, tachycardia at 300, 150 beats per minute. Now we're dealing with, you know, an undiagnosed narrow complex rhythm at exactly 150 beats per minute with a big giant negative P wave here, that doesn't work. So then if you look at it, you'll see these are flutter waves. They march out at 300 beats per minute. Classic atrial flutter with two to one conduction. How about the bottom strip? Junctional rhythm. Junctional rhythm, Exa exactly. This is gonna be an accelerated junctional rhythm. 300, 150, 175, let's say like 85 beats per minute, right? Junctional rhythm is uh, typically gonna be whatever, less than 60 beats per minute and 60 to 100 accelerated junctional rhythm. Um, okay. How about the top strip here? Our good old friend AFib. Yes, irregularly regular, no clear, you know, atrial activity in the bottom strip. Neil, Neil here. This is Matt. Is it Matt or is it Neil? Just kidding. The answer, the answer is Matt, right? Multifocal. <laughs> The answer is Oh, bad. my God. Sorry. I just got it's that. That's so bad. Oh, I got you. That's, That's so bad. bad. Thank oh. you. Exactly. How about the top one? Idioventricular rhythm. Yes. This will be accelerated. Idio, 300, 151, and 70, 75 beats per minute. Accelerated idioventricular rhythm, typically seen in the setting of myocardial ischemia infarction. Don't misdiagnose it as ventricular tachycardia. Don't suppress it with antiarrhythmic agents. These patients, if it's AIVR, you know, typically in the setting of reperfusion phase of myocardial infarction, they're going to do fine. It's going to go away. They're going to be back in sinus rhythm if you just leave it alone. How about the bottom one? Good old fashioned idioventricular rhythm. <laughs> exactly. It's good old fashioned. You know, you know that that's slow enough. That's just got to be some idioventricular rhythm. Okay, and then again, for ventricular rhythms, atrioventricular, less than 40 beats per minute, 
accelerated atrioventricular rhythm, 40 to 100. VTAC, you know, probably AIVR probably goes up to about 110. VTAC typically starting in the range of whatever, 115, 120. And obviously VFib is uh, undiscernible, but the QRS has made just look the same for all of them. Do we have uh, 920? Um, let's take another question here. Which of the following correctly describes the ECG features of second degree type one AV block? Um, Neil here. Uh, is it constant PR with a uh, followed by a drop beat? Um, I'm gonna say no, but it's a good uh, it's a good trial. It's another one. So whoever, if you want to make another try, there's only three left. This one is very specific for the arrhythmia circumstance. The answer here is grouped beating. What happens in type one, uh, second degree AV block, and it can happen in type two, second degree AV block, right? You've got a prolonged PR, longer, longer, and then you have a P wave with a drop QRS. But if you look at the, at the rhythm strip, what's gonna happen because of the intermittently dropped QRSs is that you're gonna have clustering of the other QRSs and that's called group beating. Here's a patient, right? This one strip is from a patient with Winkebach, type one second degree AV block, and I've split it into, divided it up here, but you'll see the little yellow areas here. These are all clusters of QRSs. This is called group beating, right? The sinus node is just beating right through here. It's marching along. It has no idea that there's a problem at the AV node. And then you're intermittently just not conducting and you have group beating. But the group beating pattern is sort of classic for um, type one second degree AV block. Which of the five, whoops, which of the following AV nodal blocks is most commonly associated with acute inferior wall myocardial infarction? I would guess third degree. My assumption it would be a high grade block. So either second degree type two or third degree. Well, well, keep what? Going, keep Matt. going, keep going. No, 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 no. I want you to speak, please. I thought you were done. I'm sorry. Thank Are you, you done? You should apologize to me. I'm sorry. I, I think it's third degree. B. Wait, is, is someone else going to say something else? I think it's wrong based on the fact that you, that Sam's interior paused. <laughs> uh, no, the issue. So, I so, think so, I think it's uh, I think it's just first degree. The issue That's here, guess. Well, because I think like, it's second degree, because, second degree type one. Well, now you now it's a 50 50 shot. So <laughs> I think it's second degree type two. I'm I'm actually short second degree type one. So, second degree type one is always more common than second degree type two. So fuck it up. Um, but the issue here, I think, is because they're asking which is most commonly associated. And it's actually second degree type one. Wow. I just got here. Already questioned it. That's great. <laughs> um, but if you look, here's an example. Here's a patient who's got an obvious, right, inferior STEMI, ST elevation, 2, 3, and AVF, reciprocal changes in 1 and L. You can actually see a little bit extra ST elevation in 3 compared with 2. And actually, this is probably a right ventricular and inferior STEMI. Notice that there's ST elevation in V1 and V3, and it's down in two because it's probably also posterior, infero posterior and right ventricular. But the point here is actually the rhythm. Um, this is a type one second degree AV block, PR, longer PR, and then you drop. And here, so this is four to three. This is uh, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six to five. And what's going on right, 85% of people are RCA dominant. So the right coronary artery is supplying the inferior wall in 85% of people. And the AV node is getting its supply from the same artery. It's typically getting a, 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 the major portion of its supply from the RCA. And so whether it's right ventricular, whether it's inferior, no matter where along here it's obstructed, it's typically an RCA infarct that causes a type one second degree AV block let me just show you, here's another RCA supplies the AV node here. And the point is that what happens is it usually causes ischemia of the AV node. And the ischemia, the first thing that happens 
with a little bit of a scheme is you get a type one second degree AV block. It takes more block to give you the third degree AV block. And I think that's the reason why type one second degree AV block is you know, more of the answer. 72 year old man presents with chest heaviness associated with diaphoresis, shortness of breath, acute occlusion of which of the following R's is most likely to cause transient complete AV block with a narrow QRS complex. It's the same thing. It's the RCA. To say that. It's the RCA transient complete AV block. Here's an example, like right here, massive, right? He's got a massive infarct. They got this giant inferior infarct, huge posterior component. If you look at it, right, the atrial rate here, you see P waves marching through here. Uh, I guess I've lost my cursor. There it is. P waves marching through at 90 beats per minute. The ventricular rate is about 36 beats per minute. It looks like it's a junctional. I've marked them with J's, a junctional escape rhythm, but it's the same kind of issue. Um, you're just having excessive, more ischemia of the AV node. And most of these patients are actually going to come right back. I've got four minutes. Alyssa, I'm sorry. I want to see what happens. Four minutes. What is this? Second degree type two. Yes, second degree type two. And why would we say that? You see there's clusters. Again, there's group beating here. Um, and the uh, you'll see the PR interval is constant. And then suddenly without warning, you drop a QRS. That's the classic uh, you know, sign of a type two second degree AV block. Here you see the P waves marching through. You can see there's four to three, two to one, two to one, three to two. It's just it's sort of varying. The degree of block is varying. Sometimes the P waves conduct to QRS complexes and sometimes they don't. That's the classic definition of a second degree AV block. This is not going to be a complete AV block. This cannot be third degree AV block. In third degree AV block, the P waves are going to march through at their rate. The QRSs are going to march through at their rate. And the P wave rate is going to be faster than the QRS rate. The very fact that you have group beating here tells you this is a form of second degree AV block. Here it is again. The PR interval is constant, and then you drop a QRS. Here you can see it 215 milliseconds for each PR interval, and then it's dropped. How about this? What's this? Oh, we've got three minutes. Now, again, key here, remember, when you're <clears throat> looking for an arrhythmia, you want to find the P waves, you want to find the QRSs. What is the relationship? Lead two is your key first lead. Lead two, maybe lead AV1. If you look in the rhythm strip, The QRS rate is 300, 150, 175, 60, 50, 40, 33. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. The QRS rate is 42 beats per minute. It's bradycardic. Why is that? Because the patient's in two to one. This is two to one block. Every other P wave is not conducting to a QRS. How about this? Two minutes. Same theme. Three to one. Thank you so much. This is three to one block, and this is a high grade second degree AV block. You see the P waves marching through, and it's very tricky. Three to one blocks often have a P wave hiding in the preceding T wave. And so sometimes people look at this and they call it two to one. But if you march out the P waves, the only way it'll work is if there's a P wave hidden in these T waves. Uh, we've got this thing here on my, right? So the atrial rate is 90 beats per minute. And the ventricular rate is 30. Actually, if you count it out, right? Five times six is 30. So it works out three to one. And again, the first, you'll notice the PR interval here is exactly the same each time it's in front of the QRS complex like this. 
because you might look at this and think this is complete, you know, third degree AV block, and maybe it is, but it's statistically unlikely that you're going to get exactly the same PR interval, you know, every time. Okay, with that, it's 9.30. I have to seed my, uh, seed the podium here to Dr. Moore. Thank you so much for your time and best wishes uh, on the, uh, on the exam. Thank you, Sam. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Centuria. Take care. Thank you, Neil. Oh, he did. Oh, he didn't hear that. Damn. Uh, hi, Dr. Moore. How are you doing? Good evening. I'm good. Thanks. Uh, how are you guys doing? Just Neely. We're doing great. Uh, yeah, I was going to say, is the real Neil here? Or <laughs> I don't actually think <laughs> the, the real... real Neil is here. Yeah, I was like, can the real Neil please stand up? Because I don't see him. But All right, let me uh, share my screen. Um... Okay. So I don't think, you know, I mean, I love talks. I don't know if it's going to be as exciting as Sam's review, but we will. Sorry. Hold on one sec. Um, there we go. I'm having a weird view issue on my side. Okay. So um, my goal today is just going to be to go through um, some of the, the major kind of talks, uh, things that tend to show up. I don't, there's um, not a ton of like new talk stuff. So a lot of this is going to be like bread and butter uh, things that are on the, um, on the, on the end training exam and the board exams. It's a lot of kind of like, um, the stuff about antidotes and kind of EKGs that you may never see in real life, but that they like to kind of obscurely, um, pull out for things. Um, there might be some plant pictures, um, and, uh, things like that. So we'll go through ones I think potentially could show up. Um, if at any point you guys have, uh, questions or like specifically a topic that you have concerns about, then let me know. Um, I'm going to try and cover, um, you know, we'll do a brief review of toxidromes, uh, and then we'll kind of do some question-based stuff with some like bread and other bread and butter things kind of thrown in. So hopefully, um, it will be helpful. Uh, so, um, let's talk about, uh, cholinergic toxicity. Like anyone have any thoughts about some questions that might, or some, some, um, key things in the stem of your question that may lead you to a uh, cholinergic toxicity. I'm like, what, what are you going to define as cholinergic toxicity? What would you be concerned about in that question stem? Um, for the situation, I would say like a terrorist attack or um, like maybe pesticides or something like that. Right. Exactly. Like, so there, there might be some of those types of questions. And then in, in the big also thing medication, that, medication induced. Yeah. Um, which would be, you know, it's a little bit less, less common in terms of outpatient stuff, but you may see something about like a patient was admitted to the hospital for testing and then they ended up having these kind of symptoms. But usually I think you're right um, in that the majority of the questions are probably going to be based off of um, some sort of like mass casualty or terror kind of um, kind of stem. Um, but the big thing to remember with cholinergic toxicity um, is really going to be your, you know, um, your vital signs kind of with all of these toxidromes. Um, so, uh, you know, you can think of sludge as a mnemonic. I think dumbbells is a little bit better. And then really the big thing is killer bees. So if you're looking for like mnemonics and things to go by, but bradycardia, bronchorrhea, bronchospasm are going to be the three um, kind of more, you know, high, high mortality um, things that you're going to worry about, but they're also going to have all those sludge symptoms like salivation, lacrimation, urination, defecation, um, so lots of diarrhea, um, vomiting, um, pupils are going to be pinpoint, um, and then they may also, you know, have some things about seizures or fasciculations uh, in the stem. In terms of the antidote for cholinergic toxidrome, and I think that's sort of what they're going to be getting at with a question, um, the most important one that you need to focus on is atropine, Okay. Um, the big thing here with atropine is that, um, and oh, sorry, and the other like finding is going to be their skin is going to be really diaphoretic. 
Um, so the thing with atro um, atropine is that um, you want to dose it until you see improvement uh, in their respiratory symptoms. Um, so we're not dosing it for tachycardia. We're not dosing it for pupillary response because there can be topical um, effects on the pupil, like from gases or other things um, that way that you may not see pupillary change. So the main kind of goal in terms of your atropine is to dry up respiratory secretions and improve respiratory um, respiratory symptoms. The the other thing that they're going to probably ask about is pralidoxime or 2PAM, right? And so, you know, this, um, they're not going to get into like complex questions of like, do you start a drip? It's just sort of, when do we use 2PAM? The concern would be if you had an organophosphate. So this is going to be your, you know, your, um, your uh, biological, not biological, your chemical weapons and warfare. So this is when we would give it. But even if you had a pesticide exposure, there are organophosphate pesticides. So we give 2PAM. Um, 2PAM or pralidoxime is basically preventing um, what we call aging, which is a covalent bond from forming between the, the organophosphate and the acetylcholinesterase. Um, uh, when that covalent bond forms, then it's permanent and you can't um, you basically have to wait to regenerate your acetylcholinesterase. Um, whereas if we can, we pralidoxime can kind of intercept and basically bind to that organophosphate um, and prevent it from forming that covalent bond or aging. Um, and all of organophosphates have different um, aging like timeframes. So the majority are going to be like 24, you know, like 12 to 24 hours, but some of the, some of the like, um, agent nerve agents like VX, um, those types of things have a much shorter aging. So, you know, if this, so again, I don't think they're going to ask you this on boards so that I wouldn't worry so much about it. It's just more just that you would give atropine and that you would give pralidoxine. But if you're going to ask which one you would give priority to, it would be atropine because that's going to be your life-saving medication in these cases. Okay. Um, oops, sorry. So anticholinergic, right? If we're just going to the opposite what do you see with anticholinergic toxidrome? Anybody? Dry skin and mucous Yeah, so it's going to be like medriasis, dry skin, um, urinary retention, um, like mumbled speech, delirium. Um, they're not going to be terribly febrile. So if you're seeing someone who's like hyperthermic or febrile, that's a little not, it's like less likely anticholinergic. I think the big thing here is going to be the antidote. So what's our antidote option? It's going to be physostigmine or supportive care uh, with benzodiazepines. Um, you know, we have a physo shortage. It, this is not going to make it to your IT exam. So they're not going to be asking you about using like rivastigmine or alternatives to physo. I think if there's a question about anticholinergic delirium, it's going to be FISO. Um, I think the one thing to kind of remember is just any potential contraindications to physostigmine. So that would be like patients with who are seizing or have known seizure disorders or patients with heart blocks or bradycardia um, or severe asthma. Again, I don't think they're going to get that detailed into it. I think it's more going to be like, oh, you have this patient who ingested this like plant tea and now they're like really delirious and hallucinating and, and dry and you know, retaining urine, what, what's your option for, what's your option for treatment? And I think FISO is you know, going to be your answer. So that's just something to consider there. Um, sympathomimetic toxicity, I, I don't think they're going to go too much into this specifically, but just sort of remember that if, you know, it's going to be tachycardia, hypertension, these you can see hyperthermia with. Um, big thing here is going to be cooling for patients. Um, and then uh, you know, benzodiazepines and supportive care. I don't think there's, I don't think for an IT question, that's going to be one that's going to pop up because there really isn't like a true antidote or anything that they're going to kind of come at you with. Um, for serotonin syndrome, this might kind of be one that shows up. So I think things to think about are like, are they on more than one um, serotonergic agent? So was there, are they on an SSRI and, you know, um, tramadol or using, um, other substances, or did they have multiple SSRIs or multiple psychiatric medications? Um, and then, you know, things that are, I think clues in the STEM are going to be, um, are there um, signs of clonus, uh, rigidity, um, 
that type of thing. Remember, these patients can have diaphoresis. They're also flushed. They also have um, medriasis. But the things that really kind of differentiate them from something like um, an NMS uh, syndrome or anticholinergic syndrome is going to be um, the, the clonus. Uh, and then, you know, again, your antidote for the boards for these questions is going to be ciproheptadine. Um, in, in real life, you know, we can consider it, but it really doesn't have the same um, like clinical effect, I think, in practice as we would hope it, you know, it's not the end all be all in terms of like, you're magically solving everyone's serotonin syndrome, but it's an option. The problem with it is it's only oral. So you have to either have an NG tube in or have someone who can t tolerate or able to swallow. And if they're altered, that can be, be difficult. So really benzodiazepines and cessation of the serotonergic agents are the mainstay of treatment and with time, but ciproheptadine, if they're specifically asking for like an uh, antidote, that's what's going to be your antidote uh, for these questions. Um, opioids, I'm not going to get too much into. I think you guys will be prepared for these questions, but basically, you know, naloxone for opioid um, toxicity. And just, you know, remember that they're, I mean, I think you guys all are pretty clear with what this, what the presentation of an opioid toxic person is going to look like. Um, and then, I think that's pretty much it. I don't think, you know, I, I don't know if they're going to, would go into like an alcohol withdrawal kind of picture. Um, but again, you know, I think our options are really um, benzodiazepines, barbiturates. I don't, they're not going to ask you about other adjuncts like ketamine. Um, I think the main thing is going to be really just like appropriate treatment with uh, like recognizing DTs and, um, and giving benzos or, or, or barbiturates. Okay. So any questions about about those like toxidrome type stuff. We're gonna get into more like specifics and more interesting stuff. I just kind of wanted to go through some of the big toxidromes that they might um, kind of test you on. All right, so here's our first question. Um, and they, like they, there are some, a lot of visual stimulus tox questions. So that's, I tried to put some pictures and things in here that might be asked that are a little bit more um, rare. So this is a question one is a worker collapses in a sewer and his friend attempts to rescue him. Um, but she also collapses upon arrival to the emergency department. You find these coins uh, in their pocket. Anyone know what the, the, um, the toxin is? Is it uh, hydrogen sulfide? Yeah, that's correct. I don't, I don't know why, but okay. <laughs> so there's a couple of reasons why. So one, hydrogen sulfide is um, is found in the breakdown of like a lot of nitro nitrogenous um, containing products. So it tends to be very common in sewer gas. Uh, um, there's just like a lot of breakdown of organic materials. So a lot of the times the question is going to be like the most common exposure that we see for hydrogen sulfide is this exact situation where someone's going into a sewer or into some sort of underground tunnel adjacent to a sewer um, and they collapse and then they have multiple people go in to rescue them and they collapse um, as well because it's a, it's a pretty quick, um, like we call it drop down gas. And so it doesn't take much time when it's at a toxic level for people to become unconscious. Um, so that's the first kind of hint in your question stem here. The other is the coins. It's a little bit tough in this picture, but hydrogen sulfide does turn um, metallic objects. Like it, it, it kind of um, creates this like black um, color change. So you can see like on, in these pictures on the left, these are normal quarters. And then on the right, you can see that they're this kind of tarnished um, and that will happen with any sort of metallic objects. So you can look at keys or coins. Um, and and that's a that's a hint. Um, so again, it's not a, more, a common thing that we see clinically, um, because uh, because you know um, we try and maintain our sewers and it's like prevent this from happening. These build up of gas, um, but this is this is a common like every couple of years you'll hear a story about um, uh, workers who end up um, end up having this like drop down gas. The other kind of place that we see this frequently. Um, is going to be uh, volcanic eruptions. So if, um, you know, in some volcanic eruptions, people who are very close to the volcano can have, um, can, can be affected by hydrogen sulfide that's released from volcanoes. For a while, there was something called detergent suicides that were really popular. Um, and this was um, basically people that were, you can mix common household 
products uh, to create hydrogen sulfide. And so they were um, mixing them and then uh, in their cars in a contained environment so that the gas wouldn't leak out and kill anybody else. And then putting like signs on the window saying like, this was hydrogen sulfide or whatever um, so to be to, like to take care before opening the doors. Because initially when people are doing this, they were doing it in this in the home and then it was affecting other people in their, in their homes or apartments. Um, so this was a way we, this was like in the early 2000s, this was a pretty popular way of people trying to commit suicide or committing suicide. Um, we, we haven't really seen it as much lately, but I remember like when I was in, in college, I'm old, um, that we would, that this was like a big thing that people were doing. So, um, I don't think that they're going to ask you for, um, treatment for this, um, cause it, it gets a little bit, um, kind of esoteric, but this, the treatment is going to be sodium nitrate for these patients. Uh, a lot of times, unfortunately, because of just the environment, um, they may already be in, in like have cardiovascular collapse and then, um, sorry, the, tr the treatment is sodium thiosulfate. The, the problem is once they get into the, the hospital, uh, a lot of times they've already had like cardiovascular collapse and, um, and are coding and, and oftentimes aren't able to be resuscitated, but that's, you know, it's going to be good support of care and then, and then the sodium thiosulfate. So, um, again, the, I think the questions, if they do come up for you guys for board stuff is going to be related to the, the coins and then the drop down kind of history with being in a sewer. All right. So this is the next question. Um, a 35 year old man presents after overdose of his migraine medication. This is his EKG. What did he ingest? A. I think isn't it um isn't it C? Like propanol has some sodium channel blockade. Come on, no, it's not. Yeah. yeah oh, Doctor Moore. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. So the good. I mean, sumatriptan in general overdose doesn't really cause. Um, terrible toxicity. It's more. It does cause vasoconstriction, so people will feel terrible because they'll feel like that vasoconstriction. And then I guess in patients that have high risk for, um, for like MI or other things, you can see, you know, potentially like some demand ischemia or something like that. Um, ibuprofen uh, doesn't usually cause EKG changes. The main issues are going to be potentially like CNS, like renal, um, and, um, uh, um basically like a non anion gap metabolic acidosis. And then you can have the CNS like with uh, mental status depression and like massive overdoses, you may need to, uh, to intubate for that. But for the most part, like again, ibuprofen is pretty well tolerated and we don't see toxicity until patients are taking like 200 milligrams per, per kilogram kind of thing. So taking hundreds of, of pills. Um, so propranol, you're right, is, um, it's a beta blocker, um, but it also has, um, sodium channel blockade. So in overdose, we can see these kind of wide complex looking um, rhythms uh, and tachycardias, you know, bef before they go into like their profound uh, bradycardia, they can also, it also is very lipophilic. So it crosses the blood brain barrier um, and uh, can cause CNS depression uh, as well. So, and, and sometimes seizure. So there's something to kind of think about with propranol. I kind of brought it up too, just so that we're, so we're gonna talk a little bit about, I'm sorry, this was the EKG, just about sodium channel blockade. Let me see, I see some comments. Um, Nothing appropriate, Dr. Moore, please ignore us. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> <It's fine. laughs> no worries. All right, so, um, you know, other things that I think would come up on, um, on ITE in terms of sodium channel blockade um, is going to be the TCAs, right? So we talk about um, the seven deadly sins of TCAs. We don't really see, um, again, a ton clinically anymore of TCA overdose, just because we don't, so many patients are on SSRIs or SNRIs, um, though we, you know, we still occasionally see it and they do still like to test for it because it does have, because they have so many effects. Um, so I think the big, so when we talk about the seven deadly sins, it's like the seven receptors that are affected by, um, by TCAs and then the, the things that kind of result from that. So I think the main, the main clinical presentation is going to be altered mental status. These patients can be anticholinergic, which we'll talk about, but they often can come in completely like obtunded. Um, so, and they're very tachycardic. They can be hypotensive. They can have seizures, right? So when we talk about it one, like their first 
um, the receptor effects are going to be antihistamine. Um, so they can, you know, this contributes to some of the sedation. There's anticholinergic, specifically anti-muscarinic toxicity, right? So we can see tach tachycardia, delirium, um, hallucinations. The pupils on these patients are are probably going to may, may be large, but it's not as great of an indicator um, of their toxicity because there's so many different um, receptor effects that they may be more mid-range, to be honest, because there's some alpha effects as well. Um, it has serotonin um, and, uh, antagonism, like, right? So we, this is why we take it therapeutically is it's increasing your serotonin. So, um, you know, we can see um, serotonin syndrome potentially, to, you know, in patients that are on other serotonergic agents. Um, it's a GABA antagonist. So this is what is thought to cause seizures um, in, in these overdoses of patients with TCA. And then um, basically the alpha um, adrenergic antagonism, this is mostly alpha one, it can cause hypotension. Um, and then sodium channel blockade, like we talked about with the propranolol. So that can certainly lead to arrhythmias and, and cardiac arrest. And then it, it's also a calcium channel block has calcium channel blockade. So we can see, um, prolonged, Q, um, QTC and then also, um, you know, torsades and other pictures that kind of result from that. So, the, you know, in general, these drugs can be nasty in overdose. What would you, what would be your options for treatment? Anyone want to talk about, like, if you had a patient that was, let's say, coding and came in with wide complex tachycardia in this patient, what would you want to do? Sodium bicarb. Yeah. So sodium bicarb is, I think, going to be your first choice. And there's a couple of reasons. One, it's a, it's has high concentration of sodium, right? So you have each um you have 150 milliequivalents of sodium in, in amp, um, or sorry, 50 milliequivalents of sodium in, in amp, and you're giving if you're giving multiple amps. Um at, it, so that's one thing. So it's increasing sodium at, at the sodium channels to help kind of prevent some of that, you know, to offset the that blockade. The other thing that sodium bicarb does is that it raises your pH. So um TCA specifically, but a lot of sodium channel blockers in general have higher affinity uh, for the sodium channel when the pH is lower. So when the patient is acidemic. So if they're seizing or if they're, um, you know, all these other things that could cause them to be acidemic, they're, then they're, you're going to have increased toxicity and binding basically at the sodium channel. So keeping them alkalemic is going to help as well to reduce some of your sodium channel effects. Um, when we talk about like... Um, a lipid emulsion therapy or an intralipid. Um, the TCAs is still one of the things that we do consider giving um, lipid to, lipid, uh, um, like intralipid to. Uh, the, their studies really do show that it, it seems to have a, um, an effect. And clinically, I, I agree with that. So that if that's a question, you know, like if there, if that's an option, potentially, I would still go with the, the number one thing, which would be your sodium bicarb. But if, um, if there's like a higher level question, you can give intralipid to these patients. Um, other sodium channel blockers to kind of think about too, just remember cocaine, right? So cocaine is also a sodium channel blocker. Um, anything else that you guys could, could give for patients with sodium channel blockade, um, who are in arrest? Like, if you will, is there any antiarrhythmic of choice that you might give these patients? Is it lidocaine? Yeah, you're right. So, lidocaine is an, an option. It's probably better um, than giving like a amiodarone or something like that if you have a high suspicion that it's sodium channel blockade that's causing your arrest. Um, and the reason behind this theory is that, you know, lidocaine and all the, and the local anesthetics in general um, are also sodium channel blockers. That's why we give um, intra, intralipid for local anesthetic toxicity because it, um, if, you know, affects the sodium channel and there's, it, and intralipid seems to work in terms of preventing the local anesthetics, which are highly lipophilic from binding to the, the sodium channel. But um, the thing about lidocaine is that it is has a quick on and off, right? So it binds to the receptor and then it, it releases from the receptor. So in, in something like a TCA overdose, um, if the patient is coding and in a wide complex um, tachycardia, giving something like lidocaine 
the thought is that you're competitively inhibiting the binding of the TCA or whatever your other sodium channel blocker is uh, to the channel with lidocaine, then lidocaine is going to pop off. And so you may, that may also help to treat your, at least your cardiac arrest part of the, the toxicity there. So lidocaine is an option. So any questions about sodium, sorry, sodium channel um, uh, blockade? Um, I have one question. Yeah. Uh, so since they have some GABA antagonism, mm -hmm. if you pushed a few amps of bicarb and someone's still, like, I guess if someone's seizing and you think they, you know, are seizing from a TCA or one of those, like, are you, like, and you pushed a few amps of bicarb, like, would you just keep going with the bicarb or would you try like a benzo too? Or would you do benzo but, first, you know? I mean, I would do, I think, so um, I would probably do both at the same time. It's likely not the sodium channel. We do have sodium, you know, channels in our brain, but in terms of the seizure activity in these patients, it's probably not the sodium channel. Them, it's not the sodium channel blockade itself that's causing the seizures. It is a marker of higher risk of seizure and that GABA antagonist effect. So there's there's that article that everyone kind of cites, like the Lovejoy article that talks about like looking at QRS duration and the risk of seizure and then cardiac arrest. Um, and they, you know, they found, I think with the QRS greater than 140, you have higher risk of seizure. And with QRS greater than like 160 is when we start to see like um, arrhythmias and, and arrest. So um, I would I would still treat the, the the sodium channel blockade with sodium bicarb to prevent potentially the cardiac effects. Um, but it's really just an indicator of severity of your toxicity. So I would give a benzo or a barbiturate, give some sort of GABA. Um, I think you could start with benzos and if it's refractory, then you could consider barbiturates um, for, for seizure in these patients. I don't think Kepra is going to do much. Um, it's not, I don't think it's harmful to give to these patients. Um, uh, and, you know, so if you give it, it's not the end of the world, but I think the, f the main thing is going to be um, increasing their GABA. So doing, so benzos are barbiturates. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, anyone know which below, what can cause this rhythm? This looks like torsades. Mm -hmm. um, so you're looking for something that prolongs the QT. So out of these, the only one I remember from med school is sodalol. Um, yeah. It's probably a reason why we don't see it very often anymore. <laughs> yeah. So sodalol, it definitely um, has, has high risk of QT, C prolongation. So a lot of times the patients actually start this med, they're actually started in the, in the hospital um, and are monitored for like 24 to 48 hours, um, to make sure that there's not prolongation of their QTC interval. Like I remember again, like when I was in residency and had to cover cardiology service, like they would, we would monitor patients overnight while they, while they were being like initiated on, on soda law. So, um, it can happen, you know, in the initiation period, but more commonly, even if patients take one extra of their sodalol, um, you know, by accident or something, they can be at risk uh, because there's a very narrow therapeutic window uh, for this drug. So just something to remember um, in terms of QTC prolongation. Uh, and then just remember there's like a lot of other other medications that can cause QTC prolongation. Um, the, I think the big one that comes up a lot in terms of a tox perspective is going to be methadone. Um, so just remember, um, you know, that methadone can definitely, um, cause QTC prolongation, especially in, in overdose, um, or just patient, any patients that are over a hundred milligrams a day of methadone have a risk for it. So just with our patient population, I, there's a lot of patients that are on like 160 or 180 milligrams of methadone, which is kind of crazy. So it's just high risk that they could go into, into torsades, um, or have QTC prolongation, so just something to kind of think about if there's like a tox kind of related torsades that pops up. Um, okay, I'm gonna keep uh, moving to some of the like visual stimulus. So what is the antidote for toxicity from this point?
I'm going to say Digifab. Yeah, I was also going to say Digifab. All right, good. So we have multiple correct answers. That, was a, know that was a random guess. So it was a random guess. Okay. Shouldn't give me any credit. Yeah. <laughs> really? Because oh. it's a flower. Matt, yeah, it's but a like there, are, there are a lot of flowers out there. <laughs> <I> don't... <laughs> Anyone know what flower this is? Foxglove. Yeah. So foxglove, so the original, the original dig, right? Like, um, so yes. So this is a lot of the plants that I, that they like to ask about on, um, on the boards are going to be. Um, cardio toxic plants so this is one of them so just kind of remember digitalis um, and then other ones or, or um, that we would see that have the same cardio cardiac like the side effects so similar to dig, dig toxicity are going to be a lily of the valley um, what is a common one and then oleander will pop up a lot so um, just kind of remember other plants that I think uh, and I don't know if I have a picture. If not, I'll pull one up at the end. But other plants that I think are going to pop up potentially um, as a on on the in training exam or on the boards um, would be um, would uh, uh, would be like anticholinergic type of plants. So datura or jimson weed, I think, is the other one that they might um, show up there. And then the the last one would be um, lily of the valley. Or colchicine. So um, it, I, I forgot to put the slides in on those, but I'll I'll pull them up at the end. I'll just do a quick Google image search and we can just look at those two just so that you see what they look like. Okay. Um, so just in terms of dig, like I think they still like to ask a lot of questions about dig on the in-training exam and the um and the boards. Again, it's been a bit since I've taken the boards or the in-training exam, but when I've looked at like the, you know, at the ACGME kind of talks curriculum, dig still pops up a lot, even though we don't see it as much clinically as we used to, especially in the Northeast. I feel like I did see it a little bit more out West. Like there's still some old school cardiologists that like to use it. Um, but, you know, I think the big things to look at in terms of EKGs, you know, the, the, the first one is going to be this, this idea of the Salvador Dali mustache kind of looking like scooped ST segment. Um, and this does not mean that the patient is toxic from dig, right? This is just a, we call it a digitalis effect or dig effect. Um, and it can be seen in therapeutic um, concentrations. From a clinical tox perspective, this can be helpful in plant ingestions because if we see this and there's a suspicion for a, um, a cardiac glycoside type of plant um, exposure, then that kind of says, oh, this person may actually have had a you know potentially toxic um, dose of that plant because they're, we're seeing cardiac effects from it. But it, in patients that are on DIG, this is like a normal looking um, uh, EKG segment. Um, so, and, and um, you can also see just some QT interval shortening and, and then, um, yeah, and then this like these, uh, which kind of helps to lead to this like scooped yeah, ST segment. The EKG that they do like to put on the in-training exam a lot that we don't see very, I mean, I've never, I don't think I've ever seen it clinically, but I've been tested on it on pretty every, on every board exam, um, is this one. Okay. So do you guys know what this is? I mean, it's, it's, yeah. Sorry. I, I, I like, I threw that one away. So I'm a little tired today. So it was a long shift at uh, LMH this morning. Um, so yeah, so bidirectional VTAC is, um, in, in pretty pathognomonic, for dig toxicity, um, it's very rare, even in like severe dig toxicity, to see this. But it's um, it's basically uh, the one that often they like to throw out in the visual stimulus as like a um, as a clue that this could be dig toxicity. Um, there's there's only one other plant that that can cause this um, that's not a cardiac glycoside plant, which is um, a aconitine or aconite, um, they're not going to test you on that. It's like a higher level tox, like tox board question. So for, for, um, for emergency medicine, this is, if, they, if you see something like this, then it's going to be, that's like a think dig kind of picture. Um, but in general, dig toxicity or cardiac glycosmic -like toxicity can cause pretty much any dysrhythmia, um, except for rapidly conducted supraventricular tachydysrhythmias. So like, you're not going to see like an SVT or like, um, you know, an AFib with RVR kind of picture. Um, you can see it's low AFib or uh, slow A flutter. 
Um, but most, you know, you're going to see more um, Brady um, uh, dysrhythmias or this sort of bidirectional VTAC picture. Um, what ditch? Okay, actually here, so um, what, what plant is this? Or sorry, what is the antidote for this toxicity for this plant? Is it atropine, right? Yes. Yeah. This is the... No, not atropine. Oh, no? No, sorry. All right. Never mind. I'm going to... You're, gonna you're, you're on the right track, though. I'm going to meet myself. Good. Good, Matthew. It's uh, esostigmine. Right. Yeah. Sorry. So I guess I did forget that I put this picture in. So this is, this is going to be Datura or Jimson weed. So it contains atropine. So you're on like, that's why your answer was half right, Matt, because it, um, that's atropine is like the active, it's scopolamine and atropine are the active, um, like alkaloids from the plant. Um, so this is also like called the moonflower. It looks, it can look a couple different ways. So when it's flowering, this is, uh, what it looks like. It's got these like trumpet looking flowers and there are other trumpet looking plants that have like tr these trumpet looking buds and they all tend to be anticholinergic. So that's one thing to kind of help you if you see another plant that looks kind of like a trumpeted flower. The other thing that they'll show you pictures of with, with Jimson weed is the seed, um, the seed uh, kind of pouches, which have like almost like a poppy seed looking like a little bit larger kind of dark seeds. And that's what people will take um, and like make teas out of or things like that for hallucinogenic effects. Um, so physostigmine is the correct answer because it's an anticholinergic plant and you're going to want to um, uh, treat their anticholinergic toxicity. Okay. Um, so mushrooms, well, you know, I, I don't think they're going to ask you a lot of questions about mushrooms, but there's a couple mushrooms that they might put on on and these are one of the ones um so 30 year old woman presents with nausea and vomiting eight hours after ingesting this mushroom what toxicity is expected i think it's d isn't this like a delayed hepatic failure i don't remember the mushroom or am i misremembering no, you're right. Um, so the answer is a hepatic failure, but right. I think, I think that's what you were getting at. But, um, so what I think the important thing when we're talking about mushrooms to remember is that patients who present in, in general, the majority of patients that present with nausea and vomiting within the first like four to six hours after their ingestion of the mushroom, it's usually a benign mushroom. So it's usually just like an ear tint mushroom that causes nausea and vomiting, diarrhea, and then it's self-limited. There's a couple exceptions to that, but again, those are more esoteric, like tox board level questions and not like uh, EM board questions. But what we're worried about is any patients that start having delayed symptoms, like of nausea and vomiting after six hours. So like in that six to 12 hour range um, are much more concerning for Amanita, um, phylloides, uh, mushroom, or just Amanita, mushroom toxicity, which is going to be liver failure. Um, so if, so I think what they might be getting at on the in-training exam and the board questions are going to be when the vomiting starting, and that's going to be like your clue with mushrooms, um, in terms of which ones are going to be toxic. There's a couple other mushrooms, you know, that like the gyrometra mushroom, which can cause like seizure. Um, there's quaternarius, which can cause rhabdomyolysis. I don't think that they're going, and there's an amylite, another amanita mushroom, um, which can cause renal failure, but I don't think they're going to ask questions about those mushrooms on your in training exam or your board exam. Again, I think those are more tox level mushroom questions. So I think the big thing to focus with on mushrooms is going to be when you're in, when the, when the um, vomiting uh, started. And so, and that's a good clinical thing too. Just like we are more reassured that someone, if the vomiting starts like immediately after they eat mushrooms, so like, like kids that go out in the backyard to eat like these little brown mushrooms in the yard and then have vomiting um that's like a classic little and there these mushrooms are literally called little brown mushrooms right and that's like their classic toxicity is they just cause vomiting and diarrhea so anything where it starts after six hours is where we worry about risk of hepatic failure unfortunately there's not really any you know this the majority there's not any antidote for these mushrooms so it's going to be supportive care you know early access to like a liver transplant center um, so any questions about mushrooms at all? all right. 
Um, next question. What toxin causes this finding? Patient reports that he went on a drinking binge and presents with blurry vision. Methanol? Anyone? Sorry? You said methanol? Yeah. Yeah, correct. Um, so uh, this is kind of classic methanol toxicity and then um, uh, like edema, um, op optic, um, like disc edema. Um, so the, we'll talk briefly about toxic alcohols because they love toxic alcohols on the boards. Um, so, uh, you know, methanol in general, right? So I think the three toxic alcohols that are gonna focus on for you guys on the boards are gonna be methanol, ethylene glycol, and um, isopropanol. Um, those are the ones that we're gonna, you know, I think that, that come up the most. So, you know, methanol um, found mostly in windshield wiper fluid and moonshine, right? That's gonna be kind of your, your classic um, setup. It can also be in like perfumes and some other type of things, but in terms of patients, most commonly if they're drinking windshield wiper fluid because they are they don't have money to buy alcohol and they're trying to stave off um, withdrawal or they drink windshield wiper fluid, you know, an accident or a suicide attempt and the other is more accidental with moonshine that it's not distilled properly and there's methanol um, in the mix with, with the alcohol. So with methanol, your main issue is going to be, you know, we're, we're going to see an, an anion gap metabolic acidosis plus an osmol gap, which we're going to go over. Um, and then the, the end organ damage is going to be um, vision loss is the most common, but honestly with methanol, this is a basal, it's a, meta, a mitochondrial toxin, the, uh, the formic acid. So you're going to see a lot of basal ganglia um, lesions as well, just like you would see with carbon monoxide or cyanide. Um, and so patients can also have movement disorders and altered mental status um, associated with, um, with the formic acid. But classically, when we think about it on like a board exam, it's going to be vision loss or they're going to describe it as like snowfield vision. All right, like that's sort of the classic prompt for these board exams. Um, the issue with methanol is that it's a very long half-life. Um, so these patients often need dialysis because uh, um, their methanol is just there forever, right? Um, you know, we also can treat them with fomipazole. So we'll talk a little bit more about fomipazole. Um, just looking at like, why are toxic alcohols toxic, right? So Methanol in and of itself is not toxic. It's the metabolite. So methanol is what's going to give you your osmol gap, right? That's what's going to cause the gap when you're measuring your osmols. It's metabolized by, by alcohol dehydrogenation into formaldehyde and then from formaldehyde um, by alcohol dehydrogen, uh, dehydrogenase to formic acid. And then formic acid is what we talked about is going to cause our metabolic acidosis and our organ injury. Um, Ethylene glycol, again, you're going to see an anion gap, metabolic acidosis, and an osmol gap. Um, your main clinical like um, end organ damage with this is going to be renal injury, and your most toxic um, uh, metabolite is going to be oxalic acid. Okay, so that's it forms oxalic acid crystals uh, in the in the kidney, which then cause renal failure. Um, again, most commonly, you're going to see ethylene glycol exposure and antifreeze. You may see urinary crystals, but this is not a diagnostic. Um, uh, it's non-diagnostic. So they're like a lot of patients may not have urinary crystals. So we don't, if they're the absence of urinary crystals, it does not exclude ethylene glycol toxicity. So if we talk about the metabolism here again, so ethylene glycol is what's going to give you your osmol gap. It goes from alcohol dehydrogenase to glycolaldehyde. And then from there to glycolic um, acid, which can cause some metabolic acidosis and organ injury, but really it, it's oxalic acid uh, that causes um, the majority of the, the renal injury, okay, and the metabolic acidosis. Um, so in addition, you know, for both methanol and ethylene glycol, in addition to famipazole, you can give some adjuncts. So for, for methanol, you can give uh, folate, um, and then for ethylene glycol, we can give um, like thiamine, um, and pyridoxine for, to, that can help kind of to shunt some of this, um, uh, metabolism to the non-toxic metabolites. And then finally, finally is our isopropanol, um, toxic alcohol. And remember, there's not going to be an anti-get metabolic acidosis. So you'll see ketosis without acidosis and then an osmol gap. 
Um, the main kind of issue here is going to be a hemorrhagic gastritis and just CNS depression from um, intoxication. Um, and then you may see an acetone is the, is basically the metabolite um, that's responsible for causing the ketosis. Um, most commonly found in like rubbing alcohol, hand sanitizers. Um, in some rare cases, most labs have turned away from this testing. You can get a false elevation in creatinine, um, something called the Jaffe reaction. So point of care will be normal and then the lab value will be elevated. We don't really see that. I would say most labs, like I said, have moved away from using this particular reaction. So we don't see it as much anymore, the false elevation. And that's with any ketones. Um, so any questions about toxic alcohols? Um, I have a question for like real life. Yeah. So like, when are you like when are you if you let's say like you have someone who's just like altered or something and they come in or they come in drunk and you know you don't know what they took um like when when are you sending like a serum osm or like truly considering giving fomepazole because i feel like that's something that like like it's very i feel like it's pretty rare that we get repeat labs on these people to, yeah. if you look at the anion gap going up you know what i mean yeah no i think that's a good point i mean i th i will say i think a lot of times when there is um there's a my experience clinically with patients that have had toxic alcohols uh true like toxic alcohol poisoning there's a history somewhere so like they were the history is the most important thing so they were found in a garage drinking alcohol and they then there was a bottle of antifreeze like so that type of thing or Patients will come in being like, I drank um, antifreeze because <laughs> I wanted to kill myself, right? That, there's a lot of like crazy people who drink anti, like who, who drink ethylene glycol. And my experience with ethylene glycol toxicity is a lot of times that these patients repeatedly will drink it and they have like repeated um, admissions. We had one guy in, in fellowship who I think I saw like four times in two years who was, who ended up like on dialysis after one admission for months, like finally recovered his renal function and then ended up back in the ED in the hospital again after um, antifreeze ingestion. So there, there's usually something in the history. With things like methanol, what I've seen is those patients come in and attend it, you get lab work and they're like, they, they've, they've already developed their acidosis. So there's like a higher suspicion or they tell you again, like I was drinking grain alcohol or I was drinking, you know, like wood, finisher or some, you know, something that had methanol in it. So like the, our average person who comes in off the street, who's drunk, like, I don't think you necessarily need to repeat labs or get an awesome. If you think, um, if you just think that they're intoxicated and they're clinically improving. Um, so it's more in like this in, in patients with unexplained acidosis and, or with a history that's concerning, like from either where they were found or what was found around them. So this is when it can be helpful. Like Again, I, I haven't seen it as much in New York City. And I think the reason is we don't have garages, right? Like people aren't hanging out in their garage, like watching football and getting wasted. And then like, oh, I'm going to drink this antifreeze. Or we they, there's pretty cheap alcohol sources in the city that you can get. Um, whereas like when I was in Arizona, patients were on the reservation. They were like making their own moonshine because um, they couldn't afford alcohol. Or they were like had such terrible alcohol disease that they and they ran out of money and they were drinking windshield wiper fluid and you know like that type of of thing so i think like and we definitely see you know see more accidental like kid ingestions again in like suburbia where people have access where those chemicals are being stored in their homes whereas here like most people don't drive cars or if they do drive they're not they don't have like a garage attached to their home where they have like all that kind of stuff that um so I, just, I haven't seen it as much, but, you know, I think like the only issue in terms of when to give a mipazole, if you have a high suspicion and they have an, a metabolic acidosis, um, and then I would, I would give it, uh, osmol gaps are like so frustrating, um, because they're not super accurate <laughs> and, um, and at, like we talked about, as you start to metabolize, your acidosis is going to get worse, but your, your osmol gap is going to go down. So it's really like, I think the most important thing is if you have a high suspicion to give them the bazal, and then you can get the osmol gap and try and get the ethylene glycol and the methanol levels, um, which unfortunately most hospitals in New York are send outs. Um, like we're still working as a talk service here to try and get them potentially like um, 
done at Cornell because it's like such a game changer when you can get that level back in a couple of hours versus like four days because that's not useful you know at that point so that that's it's it is complicated but I think if you ever have I don't think you need to repeat you routine labs on patients that are just drunk um, and who like appropriately metabolize and are back to their baseline with normal vital signs because during that period of time where they're sobering up um, if they're truly like toxic from a toxic alcohol, you're going to start to see some tachycardia or some vomiting or some like other kind of symptoms or visual symptoms or things that are concerning for toxicity. So. Yeah, that makes sense. Thanks. Yeah. Um, okay. So you have a woman who presents two hours after overdose with nausea, vomiting and signs of um, vital signs and VB, B, VBG is shown below. Um what is the next step of management? So her vital signs, she's like tacky, but in like soft blood pressure, she has a respiratory rate of 30 and then that's her gas. Any thoughts? So the, Isn't it? I can't okay. remember. So the second number is PCO2, right? Mm -hmm. And then it's PAO2. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't, I haven't seen these written out like that in a while. So, oh, and then it's bicarb. Yeah. I mean, I think so, that's sort of where I'm getting at. And so what would you be worried about in this patient? I feel like, oh, um, oh, I was going to say, I thought I was going to say B because I feel like doesn't oh. iron cause like a metabolic acidosis. It does, yeah. Yeah, so I don't know. That was going to be my guess, but oh. I don't. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> Is it? A, oh so, no, it's aspirin, right? What? Aspirin. Aspirin. Or yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's late toxicity. So because if you think about it, kind of looking at your PCO two, um, and your PCO, it's a little tough because we don't. I didn't put a bicarb down because that like so we we you know like an actual bicarb or I guess we do. Sorry, we do have it. It's fifteen. So you have you have someone who's at who's got a mixed metabolic, who has an has a metabolic acidosis but like with not like in a um it's just like if we were going to do like all of like uh, um our formulas and calculate everything out right like this isn't it's not just a normal compensation so our concern here is going to be aspirin and the re and you know it's two hours after overdose she's nausea vomiting um she's got some you know she's definitely like clearly hyperventilating and is acid acidemic so the concern here is going to be for salicylate. So I think those are just something to kind of think about, right? So her respiratory rate is 30. She's tachycardic. Um, those all kind of go towards your, um, and you would expect a lower, potentially lower pH with her, her bicarb. Um, so salicylate is something that often gets missed initially. So I think anytime you have an unexplained um kind of mixed picture with like a mixed metabolic alkalosis and acidosis, you got to think about salicylate, but certainly in someone who's reporting an overdose. So, okay. This one's a little bit obscure. So if, if you guys don't get it, I'm not super concerned, but sometimes it does pop up on things. Um, anyone know what can cause this finding? So we don't see it very much anymore. Um, we don't give these drugs, but this is called purple glove syndrome and it's uh, secondary to phenytoin. It's more common in patients that have gotten IV phenytoin, which we don't, you know, now we give phosphenytoin. Um, if we are going to get, if our, we are going to load someone, you know, both for cardiac uh, reasons, but also because phenytoin has been shown to cause this like purple glove kind of vasculitis picture. So it's kind of rare, but sometimes it's been, it's popped up on boards. So just something to kind of be aware of. We have like six minutes. So I want to try and get to some, a couple more things um, just to kind of go over. So what's the toxic metabolite of acetaminophen? Did you like to ask this question? What, what causes your acetaminophen toxicity? Isn't it D? Yeah, it's nap key, right? So um, basically like, you know, I'm not going to go over too much with, with this, but I think the important thing is looking at the metabolism. So your acetaminophen is metabolized, um, 
three different ways. So one is glucuronidation or, um, and the other is sulfonation. Both of these are non-toxic metabolites, but about 10% of your acetaminophen is, a um, is metabolized by um, CYP450 like and specifically 2E1. And that's what um, creates your NACI, uh, which is your toxic metabolite, which causes your hepatotoxicity. But we don't see toxicity until your glutathione stores are less than 30%. Um, because glutathione does basically kind of bind to NACI and, and make it this non-toxic um, moiety. So that's why we see delayed uh, hepatic uh, failure in patients um, if they present you know, late to the hospital uh, because usually you have to, you know, it takes eight to 12 hours to kind of go through your glutathione before you start to see um, effects. So I think the important things to remember is just like remembering your nomogram and how to read your nomogram. So for acute ingestions, um, 150 is sort of like the thing to remember with acetaminophen. So for acute ingestions, our four hour level, we get worried if the level is greater than 150. Um, and in that case, we want to start the uh, antidote. What's the antidote for acetaminophen? Anybody? NAC. NAC, right. So an N-acetylcysteine. Um, and then, you know, the, I don't know, I think on the boards, they'll probably still test you on dosing based on the old dosing, which was a three bag system of NAC. So the first dose is going to be 150 milligrams per kilogram over one hour. So again, there's your 150. Your second dose is going to be 50 milligrams per kilogram over four hours. And then your third dose is going to be 100 milligrams per kilo over um, 16 hours so that those second doses add up to 150 milligrams. We're, we've moved to a two bag system at, at Cornell and Columbia. So it's a little bit different, but that's just something to kind of remember. And then just remember that for kids, the toxic dose of acetaminophen is 150 milligrams per kilo. So 150 is sort of your, your key number. Um, I'm going to switch. We're going to go, through, well, um, I think just the, 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 what I was trying to get through with this question is basically like, if you're seeing, um, a patient who presents, who's non-diabetic, who presents with bradycardia overdose and hyperglycemia, then you want to remember that this is likely a, a calcium channel blocker overdose, right? So in this case, it's going to be likely verapamil, less likely amlodipine because verapamil is an, um, uh, is going to affect more of your AV node, whereas amlodipine is going to cause more of an issue with, sorry, verapamil is going to affect your SA node more and, and cause more of a sinus bradycardia picture, whereas amlodipine is going to act more on your peripheral um, smooth muscle, causing more vasodilation. You can see bradycardia in um, in massive like amlodipine or uh, overdoses, but really um, we expect it more in like diltiazem or verapamil overdoses. Okay. Um, when we're talking about beta blockers, uh, again, you might see sinus bradycardia and the glucose is going to be potentially normal or slightly low. Okay. So, um, uh, again, in this case, you can try glucagon for beta blocker toxicity. Um, but you, you know, uh, depending on the severity, it, it may not be effective. And then you're going to need to kind of move on to your other strategies, um, including like high dose insulin glycemic therapy and pressors and all of those things. Okay. But just they, but I do think that that's a common kind of question stem that they like to trick you with is, is specifically like looking. So look out for the glucose when you're looking at patients who are bradycardic um, and you're suspecting possible overdose. Okay. Um, this is um, uh, another potential visual stimulus. So this is like a classic kind of looking picture for a brown recluse spider envenomation. So oftentimes the, the bite will be painless. The lesion will appear like, you know, up to two days or more after the initial bite. Um, so it's kind of, you know, uh, delayed. And then they talk about this like red, white, and blue lesion where there's like a um, central kind of white um, area followed by like a, like a bluish kind of ring and then an erythematous uh, surrounding it. Um, we don't have brown recluse in New York, but certainly like the Midwest, this is a common um Envenomation, really the treatment's just going to be um, uh, supportive care with wound healing. There's no antidotes or any sort of um, antivenom for the brown recluse spider. Um, for black widow envenomations, um, this is going to be, um, 
again, a painless bite, um, but there may be some localized diaphoresis at the site of the bite site. Um, but generally there's not like a lot of inflammation or signs around where the, the spider bit. Um, in general, this causes like severe pains. It's a potent like neuromuscular toxin. So it's a, it stimulates the re release of neurotransmitter. So patients just basically have like terrible muscle spasms and cramps. Often it's like large muscle groups, including the chest, abdomen, like pelvis, thighs. So you can, it can, it used to mimic appendicitis a lot before we had CT scans, rare complications, but something to con con be concerned about are priapism and then um, uh, heart failure. So this is sort of like a Takasubo's like kind of cardiomyopathy picture or, um, where it's a catecholamine induced um, cardiomyopathy. It tends to be pretty self-limited within like two to three days. So care is supportive. There is an antivenom for this available, but it's like really not available. Like it's impossible to find the original Black Widow antivenom. And then there is a new one that they've developed, but I don't think it's very effective and I'm not sure it's actually really even on the market. Um, so it's just supportive care with like benzos, um, opioids for pain. And then, um, you know, if obviously like a supportive cardiac care, if they develop heart failure, but most patients go on to do well. Um, and again, no black widows in this part of the country. It's more, uh, like out West Midwest that they, um, I think the, we have, I'm sorry, I'm like one minute late. I do want to just go over, um, like two more things. So one is just, they love INH uh, toxicity. So I think just think about like, you know, if it, if someone comes in with status epilepticus uh, and there's a concern for um, overdose, um, you know, and they're not responding to uh, benzos, then you always want to think about giving pyridoxine, right? So, and the most common thing that is going to be INH is the cause of the status epilepticus. So I think that's, that's one of the ones to think about is is just to kind of review that. Um, and then I would say before you, the night before you take your exam, and I still do this with my board exams when I have to take it is remember, is memorize your osmol gap because there's, I feel like there's always a question on this, right? So um, just remember that your osmol, um, or how to calculate your osmol gap. So your calculated osmols are going to be two times your sodium plus your BUN over 2.8 plus glucose over 18 plus ethanol over 4.6. So you can like, when you're doing it, you know, in real time, you can kind of round up and do like BUN over three and like ETH like over four, things like that. And that should still, they, they'll make the answers enough like close by that you, you don't have to like calculate it out to the decimal points, but, but just memorize this before you go into your exam. Like this one's a good thing to remember. And then the other ones that they like to ask a lot is fish. Okay. Like your seafood toxin. So just to kind of like go over the, the two, the big ones. So ciguatoxin, right. So this is going to be, um, uh, um, you know, it's caused by dinoflagellates, um, it's uh, going to be like um, things like snapper, barracuda. Again, so these are usually patients that traveled somewhere warm and, and nice um, and then either come back to New York or you're like working in those areas. It's a combination of GI, neuro, and cardiac um, symptoms. So they tend to have temperature reversal. So the hot feels cold, cold feels hot. They can have paralysis and ultimately like respiratory failure. Um uh, dental pain or the sensation of loose teeth is very common. Uh, and then bradycardia, hypotension. Care is mostly supportive, but there has some, been some limited data for using mannitol in these patients with some um, su success. So I think the question stems that it definitely like come up are going to be the cold, hot, cold reversal and associated with the GI symptoms and then the loose tooth sensation. Um, so that's ciguatoxin. And then um, scomboroid is the other one that comes up a lot, right? And this this is, you know, the bigger, um, like, um, like fish at the kind of head of the food chain. So things like tuna, tuna is like probably the most common, right. But like, um, tuna, mahi, mahi. Um, and this is when you kind of get more of that, like histamine response. So, um, and it's, this is in, in fish that has been improperly stored. Um, so it's oftentimes like it goes to room temperature and then is re, um, like recooled, um, scomboroid is, is a heat 
um, stable toxin. So cooking doesn't kill the the toxin. And so the common symptoms are going to be flushing of the head, face, upper torso, GI symptoms like nausea, vomiting. Um, uh, patients will like just feel kind of miserable. The classic thing is that they people report like a, a like overly peppery taste uh, to the fish. Um, and the treatment is really just going to be supportive and antihistamines are the the um the antidote in this case and then really just proper storage of fish prevents the the scombroid from forming this is like a breakdown of the bacteria in the fish um last thing i think just to kind of cover is just uh, oh is um one other one is to uh, to toxin right so just remember like fugu is a sodium channel opener so you can get paralysis um and classic is like the puffer fish and people who eat fugu like sushi is when we tend to see it. So symptoms are going to be um, like perioral numbness, tingling, and then um, muscle paralysis. Uh, it's also found in the blue ringed octopus, but I don't think they're going to ask you that. It would be more of a like question stem with the puffer fish and the sushi. Um, and the last thing is going to be hydrofluoric acid, just to kind of remember um, that patients can present sort of with severe burning and pain to their, um, to their hands. If, they, uh, if they're using, um, like rest removers or, um, hydrofluoric acid for like glass etching, um, sometimes they can have normal appearing digits, but in like more severe cases, it can look like this, right? So you see, um, it, it can take up to 24 hours though, sometimes before you start to see these type of skin changes, but this is like a classic kind of hydrofluoric acid, um, burn and it, and so basically like the fluoride binds to calcium and then and magnesium and then kind of precipitates um, these like insoluble calcium fluoride like sort of complexes in this soft tissue and it can cause severe pain in like high concentrations it can cause arrhythmias and hypokalemia and some other um, issues but most commonly I think what they're going to ask about on, uh, on boards is going to be how do you treat this like hand pain and so the the main thing is going to be um, like topical, um, um, why am I having a total brain fart? Uh, calcium gluconate, basically. Um, you can also, um, inject it into the, into the skin. Um, but if it's the fingers or the hands, you probably don't want to, you know, do that because that may cause more pain just from having like a subcutaneous injection with already like swollen tissue, but you can do like a 2.5 to five, like calcium gluconate gel and put it like in a, a glove and that can sometimes help um, break down those complexes. Okay, any questions about things? Okay, last question, I promise. Yeah, no, um, you're fine. How do you get calcium gel? Calcium gluconate gel. A lot of pharmacies, like, like hospital pharmacists have it, so you, we can see if we have it, but you can also like mix it with um, petroleum jelly and then put it in a, a glove. It's another way that you can do it. Yeah, they'll take yeah. the surge loop, you know, and yeah. they'll mix that together with the uh, with the calcium gluconate. Yeah, surge loop. Sorry, that's what I meant. Yeah, the yeah, the, the, yeah. The, the yeah, the pharmacists will make that mix that up for you, Matt. I mean, but if you don't have that, you can also kind of just look online and 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 try to figure out the preparation. Yeah. So I know it's late on a Wednesday and you guys have had like conference all day and or and or worked. Um, so but feel free to ask any questions if anything pops up before your exam. I'm 